Last week in part one, man, we, we kind of went over uh, how the enemy uh, deceives us with the greatest lie that he ever told. And that is that Satan doesn't exist. Listen, the devil is not good at lying. In fact, if there was anything that the devil does perfectly, it's lie. He, he has got a lie specifically set up for every single person in this room, which is why we wanted to tackle this series, not just talking about uh, the fact that he lies telling you that he doesn't exist or tries to share to the world that he doesn't exist, but there are several other ways that the enemy deceives us and how he disguises himself. And today, I want to dive into part two, but first, let's go to 2 Corinthians here. Uh, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world for too long we have been trying to fight a battle with our bare hands that we were never meant to fight you are trying to shadow box an enemy that is jacking you up because you're trying to do it in your own strength it does not matter how strong you are because the weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. In that word strongholds, we know that it actually means a prisoner locked by deception. Somebody who's living a life based on a lie. Deceived into thinking that this life was the best that this world has to offer or that even God has to offer them because they've bought into a lie. And today, I want to start part two of beautiful deception by sharing this second deception with you, and that is this. Sin has no consequence. That is, that's, that's what we're going to be going over today, that sin has no consequence. In John chapter 5, it says, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. Who is him? So um, I always like to, you know, I, I ask myself that question from time to time. Y'all ever read and you start reading, the devotion takes you to like the middle of something, or somebody shares a scripture with you and it starts off in the middle of something, and it starts off here in the middle of something. Afterward, Jesus found him. Somebody say him. Thank you for the tens and tens of you that said that. I appreciate it. Um, so him, went and found him. You know who him was? Him was a person that had been invalid for 38 years. Was a person that had been, could not walk, could not move, could not get up. 38 years. Now, the camera people know this. We're going to give them a workout today. Because they know that I have a problem with standing still. Um, so I, you know... Look at, look at, look, look, camera one, camera two, look, camera one, <laughs> camera two. They, <laughs> they know, they're red, they know, they know. I, I have a problem. Man, I can't even comprehend what it must have been like. 30 years, I can't even stand still for 38 seconds. <laughs> and 38 years, can you imagine not being able to walk, not being able to stand, not being able to do things for yourself for 38 years? Ugh. And Jesus heals this person. And after he heals them, it says that afterward, he went and he found him. He sought him out. Listen, uh, just a side note. God wants to do more than save you today. God wants to do more than heal you today. Oh, he wants to save you. He wants to heal you. He wants you to experience freedom. But he doesn't want you to experience it one time. He wants to seek you out as you seek him out so that he can walk with you in the midst of this life. He, sa he says to the man, once he found him, he said to him, see, you have become whole. You've become whole. Sin no more, lest something worse happens to you. What could be worse than lying there for 38 years? I don't know, but I would not like to find out personally. I maybe, maybe I'm old-fashioned like that. God says, hey, man, something worse could happen to you. Really? I'm not the person that if I know a monster is on the other side of the door, that I'm going to answer the door. Do we have any people that are like that? You're crazy. You're crazy. My wife is like that. Pastor Amanda, she's like that, man. She, she would know that a monster is on the other side of the door, and she would say, but I just got to know what it looks like. <laughs> not me, not me. <laughs> not for a minute. Um, the Lord is in this place, not that place. That's a monster. Look through the peephole. I 
just want to know. And sin will cost you something. In fact, if, if we were to really unpack what sin costs, the consequence of sin, I believe that most of us would have sticker shock. Y'all know what sticker shock is? Let me, let me explain a little bit. Let me give you a little analogy. Now, I personally, this may cause some of the men in the, in the crowd and maybe even some of the women in the crowd to completely turn off and not listen to another word I say. That's fine, man. You just, you pray about it. You, you talk to God about that. I'm not a car person, okay? I'm not. How many car people we have? Y'all love cars? Looking around? Great. How many have a nice car? It's okay. God wants you to have nice stuff. Raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed in church. <laughs> I don't want everybody to know. <laughs> I'm not going to go, you got a nice car, let me ask you for a donation. I'm not going to do that. I just want to, <laughs> y'all are not helping my illustration this morning. How many of you believe like me that a car is kind of more like a necessary evil because of what it costs, right? Right? <laughs> hey, all day long. If I could bike downtown, I would, and I know that I could, I just don't want to because it's all the way over there. <laughs> it's just the truth. I'm speaking the truth in love this morning. But every time I feel like I'm getting like in a position where like, hey, man, we got, we got a little money. You know, been eating cheese sandwiches and cup of noodles and stuff. Like, we're doing all right. Yeah, if y'all don't know cheese sandwiches and cup of noodles, you need to figure that out with some hot sauce. You can make anything work. I'm telling you the truth. You get into a place, hallelujah, um, we get into a place, you get to a place where you finally get a little money. I'm like, oh, cool, we got a little bit of money saved up. This is great. I'm excited. Breaks. <sighs> be praying over your car. Let it be a battery, Lord. Let it be a $100 fix. Starter. <laughs> so <he> said, <laughs> I see a leak. Let it be the cap in the oil pan, Lord, and not, <laughs> right? It's never that. $1,000. Oh, man. I, there went my emergency fund, Dave Ramsey. <laughs> And a few years ago, we started looking for, you know, uh, for a new car. And uh, for those of y'all that may not know, I, like, I, you know, we, we got a new car a few years back. And um, how many believe that Pastor Matt is the one driving the new car? You would be correct. There are no hands. Yes, I see. I don't see those hands. You're correct. I'm not the one driving the new car. I'm the one that's driving the car with like, bop, bop, sana, sana, go, and then we go. Like, I'm, I'm driving that car. But when we went to go get this new car, I was looking around at other cars. Now, the car that we got wasn't that expensive. Why? Because I just told you, cars are necessary evil to me. I don't want to spend a bunch of money on a car. But I went and looked. That doesn't mean I don't like how cars look, right? I like, some, I like the way some cars look. I, man, some cars are sexy. <laughs> I like a sexy looking car. I'm like, hey, I like that, you know? But since it doesn't matter to my wife what kind of car I drive, I drive a hoopty. It don't matter. <laughs> Hallelujah, covenant, I got her, it's done. <laughs> but I went and looked at this car that I thought was so cool, and I went over there and I was like, man, I like the way this car looks, I really like it. And I looked at the price and I, I, I was like, I don't like that car as much anymore. And I believe that sin is the same way. If sin would reveal the cost, a lot of us would be shocked by the sticker price of sin. But the truth of the matter is, because we go into sin like this, no, it's going to be all right. <laughs> I walk by faith, not by sight. Not if there's a big blaring neon sign. <laughs> Beautiful deception, bop, bop, vacancy. Eh, eh, like, no, that's a scary movie. That's a monster. Don't open the door. We would be shocked by the cost. And I want to talk about a few of the costs this morning. The first cost is this. My sin will torment me. My sin will torment me. Torment, whether it's a severe physical or severe mental or severe emotional suffering, anguish. Sin will torment me. There's a dude named Lot in the Bible. He's family to Abraham. And his dude named Abraham is like, hey, man, I've heard from God. This is where we're going. And Lot was like, I won't go that way. I won't go this way. This way looks pretty. And that, that, that way that Lot decided to go was like this place called Sodom. Yes. And it was real jacked up there. It was like the epicenter for sin, right? Like, and who runs towards the epicenter of, 
of the earthquake. You know, oh, where's that earthquake happening? I'll be there in 10. <laughs> Nobody does that, right? But Lot was like, I want to be there. It looks nice. I don't want to go through the desert. I don't like that. I'm going to go this way. And he ends up in Sodom. So we open up this story here in Genesis 19. Check this out. As he's living there, we get to a place where God speaks to Abraham and says, look, man, I'm about to tear Sodom up. I'm going to rain down fire on Sodom. I don't like what's going on in that city. It's a bunch of sin. It's leading a bunch of people astray. I'm about to blow that city up. It's not good. I'm going to take care, I'm going to take care of it. Abraham prays and says, God, I just want you to please help Lot. Could you help Lot, please? Right? And so an angel shows up to warn Lot to say, hey, man, got to get out of the city. And when they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered. They're already safely out of the city. And the angel said, run, <laughs> run for your lives. A lot of times, because we don't see the sticker price of sin, what we end up doing with sin is we mess with it a little bit. We power walk away from sin. Mm. Right? We Tyra Banks AGT walk away from sin. Mm. <laughs> and the angel says, run for your lives and don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Sin will torment us. It will torment you to the point of hopelessness. The psalmist knows this well when he wrote, this is not in your notes, but write it down. Psalm 31 and 10, the psalmist said, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing and my strength has failed because of my iniquity, because of my sin. Because of my shortcomings, I've spent my years, my life in sorrow and in sighing. And even my strength is not there anymore because I'm, I'm fighting something that I can't seem to get a hold of. I cannot wrestle this thing to the ground with my own strength. And I'm tormented and even my body has wasted away. But sin will not only torment us, but Here's the second truth about the cost of sin. My sin will torture others. My sin will torture others. Lot's family was fleeing. Lot's wife had a problem leaving this city that she had gotten tied to, this place that she had called home, this comfortable lifestyle living in the midst of all of this sin and Lot's decision to move his family to Sodom to live in this constant state of being surrounded by sin and in sin cost Lot his wife and cost his children their mother. Look, look, look at it in Genesis 19, 26. But Lot's wife looked back. How many of you have ever tried? The angel said, what did the angel say? Run, run for your life. Run, Lot, run. And the braces came off and Lot was running. <laughs> Have you ever tried to run and look back? Anybody ever try that experiment? <laughs> if you never have, I don't encourage it. Don't recommend it. I see a lot of kids today, they may not be looking back, but they ain't paying attention to where they're going. You're going to mess around and get got. You're going to be met with some truth. Hey, I played basketball, you know, junior high, high school, and I love basketball so much. I try to play today, but I can't drop it like it's hot anymore. I got to let it down like it's warm. Um, <laughs> and, and we would scrimmage everybody. We scrimmage everybody, man. We scrimmage, you know, the, the younger boys, the older boys, we scrimmage the, the girls, we scrimmage the girls' team, and we were scrimmaging the girls' team, and one of my friends, I'm not going to say her name, uh, <laughs> but, but hey, listen, I know I shouldn't be laughing because I'm, I'm going to finish the story, and you guys are going to be like, Pastor Matt is mean, <laughs> but we're playing the girls, and, and one of my friends ran out for an outlet pass, right, big long pass down to the other side of the court, man, she was moving. She was booking it. She was quick. But she went looking like this, running. <laughs> and she didn't see the pole that holds up the backboard in the basket because she wasn't looking forward where she was going. And, <laughs> oh, 
and it looked like I wish we I wish we had boomerang back then. <laughs> I wish we could. I'd have made I made a gif in a minute. She. <laughs> Just like that, you guys, I laughed so hard. I made sure she was okay, and then I died laughing. <laughs> but a lot of times, even though we know it's not a good practice to keep our eyes behind us as we run, we still find ourselves longing for those things from the past or those sins that we once committed, those things that felt good for a moment, we find ourselves longing for that, even though we were, dis- de- we, were, we, were, we were told, we were commanded, we were helped even to say, hey, you need to get away. You need to run. Don't look back. But Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. <laughs> just pillar, just and when we read the Bible, I don't know if y'all read the Bible like I read the Bible. I like to, I do insert myself into stories and stuff. Um, but the problem with that is this. When you, when you do that, oftentimes when you're reading the Bible and you try to place yourself, man, I, I, I feel like I would feel that same anguish. Or I feel like I would feel that in that moment. Some of y'all think you're holy and you'd be like, oh, I would never uh, rebuke Jesus. I would never be, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> but, but oftentimes we put ourselves in that position by today's standards right? Or by what today looks like, right? And so we think of salt, we think of seasoning, right? Mm, salt is used for seasoning my eggs in the morning. Don't, see, don't season your bacon with salt because you'll have problems later in life. <laughs> That's not a good look. Don't do that. But back in this time, salt was not used for seasoning. Salt was used for preservation. And so this gaze of Lot's wife was preserved as she was turned into a pillar of salt in a moment. And her children, I'm sure, dealt with the torture of seeing their mother preserved forevermore with her gaze, not looking forward where God had called them or directed them, but instead looking back to the sin that she was leaving. Where's your gaze this morning? Just just think about that. Where are you gazing this morning? Are you, are you overcome by your circumstances? Are you looking back to how good life used to be? Or are you looking ahead because I'm telling you the truth? You're alive, you're breathing, you're here. Thank you, Jesus. It's by divine appointment. And God has got something for you to move forward with, not to look back to. It will torture others. And sin's end game isn't just torment and torture. But ultimately, the third truth and consequence of sin is this, that my sin leads to death. My sin leads to death. Hey, Lot lost his wife. Lot's kids lost a mom. But she lost her life. Why? Romans 6.23 tells us, it says, for the wages of sin is death. Not just pain, not just hurt, death, but the free gift of God. I'm so excited whenever I read the Bible that I know how to read and I can move forward beyond the comma. (laughs) Sometimes we get stuck in the comma and we see for the wages of sin is death. Wouldn't that be a terrible message? (laughs) Just if that was all where I left it, y'all came, hey man, welcome to Discovery Church. Hey, the wages of sin is death. Y'all have a good week. I'll see you later. Was he going to leave? I thought about it, but it's all the way over there. (laughs) I was like, no, it's good. Point proven. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, which is the good news, you can access this today no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We talk about this, and I wanted to share this with you because the fact of the matter is that this particular truth, that sin leads to death, uh, has, has, has infiltrated even the believer's life so as to say, hey, I know that I have access to grace, but I'm here to tell you this morning, why would you abuse grace? Do you have access? Hey, listen, not for a minute, no, never, not one, as I shared before, will he ever leave you or forsake you? He, he will not. He will not. But serving God 
is not just about coming on Sunday and shouting down the preacher. It's about having the faith to get you out of bed on Monday and pray. It's about not living beneath your privileges and abusing grace, but instead embracing grace and sharing that grace and love with others. Amen? Amen, man. It's a free gift, and we can't fool ourselves into thinking that we're good. Song of Solomon says that, that it's the small foxes that spoil the vine. Sin starts off, it seeps into your life. It doesn't just punch you in the throat. Remember we talked about that with sticker shock. It doesn't just punch you in the throat. <laughs> Welcome, I'm sin. Nice to meet you. It doesn't do that. It seeps in. Little compromise here. Tiny lie there. And then before you know it, tormented, tortured, dead because of the choices of sin. The truth of the matter is that uh, a life of sin is fun to plant, but it's painful to harvest. Hey, let me just tell you the truth this morning. A life of sin is fun to plant. Oh, as I can see it in some of your eyes. You're like, yeah, I'm good at sinning. I'm good at that. I got this sinning thing down. We start a small group on sinning full. Everybody's like, I'm good at that. I will be a part of this. And the pleasures of sin are even good for a season. But eventually, you're going to have to reap what you sow. And though it may feel good to plant, it is going to be painful to harvest. And you will find yourself tormented and tortured, dealing with thoughts of death and destruction in your life. And so what we need to do to combat these things and this sin that so easily ensnares us is we need to put on peace. We need to put on peace. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 in verse 11. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Listen, don't put on some of the armor. Put on all of God's armor. My son, we have Nerf Wars. And sometimes he comes out wearing a mask and calzones, that's it. Just a mask and underwear, that's it. And I'm like, son, are you sure you want to have a Nerf war with what you're wearing? Because, you know, because my, my kids are 10 and 8, and they haven't beat me yet because they can't, okay? <laughs> hey, don't let your kids beat you at stuff. <laughs> beat them. <laughs> beat them at things. Win. <laughs> when they beat you later, they'll be so happy. I finally beat him. But right now, I'm dunking on his head. I'm pushing him down. I'm... And he'll come out. All right, Dad, I'm ready. Okay. Pink dot, pink dot, pink dot, pink dot. Just everywhere, getting lit up. And some of us, that's how we treat our relationship with God. We show up to church on Sunday. We put on the helmet of salvation. And then the rest of the time, we're just naked. We just have the helmet of salvation on. All right, God, I'm ready to face the world. God's like, you better put on some more armor. You better put on the full armor or you're going to get God. There will be. Listen, listen, look. Again, look at. We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Hey, against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be able to stand firm. Standing firm firm. Hey, when you're armored up, you can face anything standing firm. I'm ready to face this. God, the entire armor of God, you go ahead and you go home and you study it. And I bet you, you won't find anything that's supposed to be armor in your back. You know why? You were never built to run away. You were built to stand firm and to move forward. Stand firm. Ephesians 6 and 15 says this, though. It says, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, from the gospel, so that you will be fully prepared and not easily ensnared. Be fully prepared. How do you do that? Man, you got to put on shoes of peace that comes from the gospel. The word of God will put, help you to put on peace. I'm a sneakerhead. I love sneakers. Wearing my Jordans today. Not because I got, you know, 
cheddar, but because I have perseverance. I'm not about that footlocker life. I'm about that Nike outlet back clearance wall life. You know what I'm talking about? I'll find a deal. And we ignore sometimes. We, some of us, we might even put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for the helmet of salvation, man. I'm, I'm geared up, but you're barefoot. And you find yourself anxious and tormented because you're barefoot, stepping on sticks. Ah, ah. Because there's a strategy for people that don't put on shoes. It's called nails, screws, rocks, pebbles, thorns. When I was a kid, I used to have to rake rocks in the backyard because we didn't have grass. That's a true story. And I used to have to feng shui the backyard, you know, like one of them Zen gardens. And we had goat heads in the back. See, some of y'all have met goat heads. They're not fun. And you step on a goat head and it ruins your day. And you're walking around in this Christian life and you, you think that you're fully prepared, but really you forgot to put on shoes. You forgot to put on shoes that are the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because of that, you have no peace because you're stepping on a bunch of stickers and you're in pain and torment. And God never intended for that to happen, but instead he wants you to be whole. John 5 and 14 it says it like this. Afterward, Jesus found him. Y'all remember him? We talked about him. See, you've become whole. That word whole means not just uh, sound in body and in mind, but it also means teaching, which does not deviate from the truth. Jesus said, I've shared the truth with you. Now go live in the truth. Don't deviate from it. Why? Because the truth will set you free. Not only will the truth make you free, but Jesus said, I have come that you would not just be free, but that you will be free indeed. That's a new kind of free. I want that kind of free. I want to operate and live and walk in the confidence of being that free. Pastor Matt, are you free? Nope, I'm free indeed. That's how I want to live. That's how I want to walk. And so we need to put on peace because there are certain things that only peace will give us. Number one, peace gives me the strength to stand. Now, I'm a 13th generation heathen second generation atheist, and I had an encounter, a very real encounter with Jesus. I had a Damascus Road experience, if you will, for those of you that know that meaning. I had a very real moment in the presence of God, and I will never forget it. And when I first got, you know, before I met Jesus, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a soul and R&B guy. That's my go-to music. I love soul music. I love R&B. Love all of that. That's my playlist. Yes. Yeah, I have some NSYNC and mariachi playlists too. That's fine. <laughs> and for those of you that are offended that I have those playlists, I have worship and prayer playlists too. Don't worry, I do. But I loved soul and Motown and funk and R&B. That was my go-to. And so when I got saved, I went looking for music that was like that, and I found this dude named Donnie McClurkin. And those of y'all, some of y'all may not even know who Donnie McClurkin is, but he sang this song, and he said, What do you do when you've done all you can and seems like it's never enough? What do you say when your friends turn away and you're all alone? What do you do when you've done all you can Seems like you can't make it through. Well, you just stand. When there's nothing left to do, you just stand. Why? Watch the Lord see you through. Some of us, we get upset when God asks us to stand and we say, God, please bring me peace so that I can get away from this. And God says, no, I want you to put on the peace that's available to you so that I can take you through it as a testimony to the rest of the world. Stand firm. In a peace that gives me the strength, the wise build on the rock because they know that storms will come. Matthew 7 is, a, is, a, is an illustration of this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came. The streams rose. The winds blew, beat against the house, yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. Peace gives me the strength 
to stand firm. Peace comes when we put it into action, which brings me to the second truth about peace, and that's this. Peace gives me the endurance to walk. Man, Isaiah 30 paints a picture of this when he says, your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or to the left, you're going to hear that. But you will defile your carved images, overlaid with silver, your idols, the things that you've put ahead of God, the things that you've been distracted by, the deceptions in your life overlaid with silver and your cast images plated with gold. You will scatter them like bloodstained cloth and will say to them, be gone. Why? Because I am so focused on standing firm and walking in the peace of God that nothing will distract me from one way or the other. The key to turning from sin is to turn toward God. It doesn't mean that things aren't going to happen in this life. It doesn't mean that you won't encounter circumstances in your everyday living. But let me share this with you. When the world tries to lean into you, lean into God. Don't, don't lean into what the world is trying to tell you. That's a lie. That's a deception. That's a distraction. When those moments come, yes, I get it. It's real. It hurts. It's hard. I get it. But lean into God and put on his peace, which will help you to stand firm and walk it through. And the last thing is this. Peace comes when we live according to God's plan, and peace gives me the courage to run. Peace gives me the courage to run. We're standing firm with this peace. The disciples, they were in this boat, and they were, they were fishermen, man. They, they probably, it was just a, probably a rickety, janky boat, man. It wasn't even a good boat. It was just, you know, a jacked up. It was like my car, you know. And the storm came. And Jesus was sleeping. Big wave. My Savior snores. Maybe yours doesn't. Pray about it. He had such peace about him that when they came down, and they were so scared, they were wigging out. Do you not even care that we die? It's rain and thunder and clouds and storm and wind and all kinds of stuff. And Jesus is like, peace, be still. And the wind was like, shh. And the waves were like, shh. Why? Because he had the strength because of peace. He stood for him in the midst of it. He didn't, he didn't ask for the storm to stop before he spoke to the storm. He was able to stand firm. Hey, don't wait for the storm to end to stand firm. Stand firm in the middle of the storm. Speak to the mountain. Speak to the wind. Speak to the waves. Speak to the storm. Because the same Jesus that did that is in you. Don't just stand firm and not move, but walk it out. Stay woke and walk it out. Hey, don't just walk, but you were even built to run. I hate running for no purpose. Ugh, I hate it. You used to have to run at the end of every practice. I used to get so mad. All right, until we make a free throw, we're running. Ugh. Somebody better make this free throw or I'm getting in a fight. And my buddy was a cross-country runner. Loved running. I said, what do you run for? He's like, oh, I just, you know, I just run. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I love you, but that's stupid. Let me tell you this truth. You were created for more than just standing. You were created for more than just sitting in a chair on Sunday morning. There's a greater freedom. There's a greater courage. There's a greater truth. There's a call. There's a gift. There's something that God has given for just you, just you. Hey, I can't do what you can do. You know why? Because I'm me and you're you. I'm thankful for that. For other times, I'm not, though, because some of y'all have better hair. <laughs> a little upset with you. <laughs> Dude's like, yeah, I know, because he's got it, and I don't. I know, man, I know. All love. 
But peace will give you the courage to run. And you were not meant to run away. You were meant to look at the fire, to look at the storm, to look at the wind, to look at the wave, to look at the walls, and to run full bore straight at it and say, if God be for me, who can be against me? He has never left me. He has never forsaken me. And he's not going to start now. I had a mentor of mine tell me one time, uh, you know, if God tells you to run into a brick wall, you sprint as hard as you can and believe he's going to make a hole. I said, okay. That's handy information to have right there, but you better be a man of prayer if you're running straight at a brick wall is all I'm saying. But what he was trying to teach me was, hey, if you operate in this peace and in this life and in this power and in this authority that you have access to and stop living beneath your privileges as a child of God, you'll, give, you'll get supernatural courage to do anything and everything that you are called to do, even in the midst of a storm. You guys, I had two years of my life in, early on in my ministry, two years of my life that I did not sleep. And I don't mean like I slept for like, Oh, you know, Matt, you got five hours a night? No, like I got like half an hour, hour, if I was lucky, for two years straight. I was so anxious. I was tormented. I was being tortured by choices and, and what do I do and how do I and what and what if I and and God brought me to the scripture that says I never sleep or slumber. And I felt checked in my spirit and he said, Hey man, if I never sleep or slumber, there's no sense in both of us being awake. So get some rest. And I took hold of that. I had the best night's sleep of my life. And I haven't been awake because of anxiety since, because God is that good. David knew a thing or two about running in God's purpose, being surrounded by enemies, because in Psalm 23, he says, hey, you prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. He didn't say he prepared a table for me after everything was all cool. He said, nope, in the middle of my enemies, God said, it's lunchtime. You go ahead and eat. I'm going to fight. 